Hello, I'm Dr. Jun Ruiz, the lead for colon cancer screening of the Medical City. March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. This year, we are collaborating with the Department of Health for a webinar called Colon Cancer Screening 2022, What's in Store for the Filipinos in the Universal Healthcare in Post-Pandemic Era. Our speakers and topics will include Dr. Mark Anthony De Luzon, Effect of the Pandemic on Patient Outcomes, Professor Jose Soliano is 45 the new 50 for the start of colon cancer screening age among Filipinos, and Dr. Clavito Cairo of the Department of Health on Closing the Gaps in Colon Cancer Care among Filipinos. Join us on March 4 at 10 o'clock here at the Medical City official Facebook page. See ya! Welcome to Colon Cancer Screening 2022. What's in store for Filipinos in the universal healthcare and post-pandemic era? A webinar by the Medical City in its advocacy for colon cancer awareness. Introducing today's moderator, the lead for colorectal cancer screening and the programs and advocacy officer of the Augusto P. Sarmiento Cancer Institute of the Medical City, Dr. Jun R. Ruiz. Good morning, doctors, healthcare professionals, our friends in the medical community, guests, and our patient partners. Welcome to our webinar entitled Colon Cancer Screening 2022. What's in store for Filipinos in the universal healthcare and post-pandemic era? This is a webinar for our colon cancer advocacy in support of the Scrap Cancer Program of the Augusto P. Sarmiento Cancer Institute of the Medical City. I am Dr. Jun Ruiz, your moderator for today's event. March is the Colon Cancer Awareness Month. Colorectal cancer, or simply colon cancer, is the third most common cancer in the world. We will focus on the importance of the life-saving potential of colon cancer screening in this era of universal healthcare and a future beyond the pandemic. For today's webinar, we have excellent speakers and we hope that you will learn and enjoy their presentations. This advocacy of the Medical City started in 2010 and continues to grow every year, resulting in more engagement with our patient partners. We are so fortunate to enjoy such a tremendous support from our top leaders from our institution. To give inspiring opening messages to formally start our event are three physician leaders from the Medical City. We have TMC's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Ruben Casala, the Director of the Augusto P. Sarmiento Cancer Institute, Dr. Beatriz Tianco, and the Head of the Section of Gastroenterology, Dr. Carla Cibolo. Let us all welcome Drs. Casala, Chanco, Cibolo. Let's give them a round of applause. Congratulations to the organizer of the Medical City Colon Awareness Webinar titled Colon Screening 2022. This webinar is very timely because colon cancer is one of the most common cancers in the country. Despite that, we don't have a national screening program in the country. The Medical City has been leading in this advocacy for early screening for more than 10 years being one of the first institutions to set up a colorectal program and colorectal clinic. With the challenges of the prolonged pandemic, we should aim to still continue proper screening for colorectal cancer because, as in any other malignancies, early diagnosis and treatment lead to better outcome. Congratulations again and welcome to this webinar. Good day to each and everyone. My name is Trixie Tianco, and I am the Consultant Director of the Augusta P. Sarmiento Cancer Institute of the Medical City. Welcome everyone to our annual get-together 
whether face-to-face -face or virtually, when we all recognize that colorectal cancer is the third most commonly diagnosed cancer in the country, and also therefore remind ourselves of our duty to have ourselves checked for this debilitating, sometimes fatal disease. Even if you are otherwise healthy but are 50 years old or above, you only need to check your stool for blood through a fecal immunohistochemical test every year, maybe every March, or have a colonoscopy done every 5 to 10 years to reassure yourself that you do not have colon or rectal cancer. Reminder also to all your relatives and friends that this is something that they should do annually and I am now reminding all health professionals to do the same. In doing so, realize that the life you save could be your own or that of the one you love. A pleasant day to all. A recently published article in JCO Global Oncology in 2020 states that colorectal cancer is the third leading site of malignancy in the Philippines with a five-year survival rate of 33.5% for colon cancer and 20% for rectal cancer. Furthermore, colorectal cancer treatment causes significant financial burden in a country like ours where healthcare is mostly shouldered by the individual. We find benefit in making sure that dreaded diseases like colorectal cancer are nipped in the bud. It is with this goal that this advocacy of the medical city for colorectal cancer awareness is being celebrated. As physicians, we have the responsibility to keep our patients informed of colorectal cancer, how to prevent it through screening, and to entice patients to get screened. I hope you will all learn and actively participate in the following sessions. Let's unite to nip colorectal cancer in the bud. Thank you. Thank you for your inspiring messages, Dr. Casala, Chanko, and Sibulo. We truly appreciate all the love. We have been celebrating our advocacy here at the Medical City with the Department of Health since 2016. Former DOH spokesperson, Dr. Eric Tayag, is among our most popular speakers as he educates us with his informative lectures and delights us with his entertaining dance steps. Indeed, the DOH has been an institution partner of the Medical City in this advocacy over the years. For 2022, we earned the support of the medical professional societies that are actively taking care of colon cancer patients. Standing side by side with the Medical City this year are the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology, the Philippine Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons, and the Philippine Society of Medical Oncologists. It does take a village to give our cancer patients the best compassionate care. And the Medical City has been the pioneer in providing multidisciplinary medical care. To give their messages from our event and to our attendees are the following. A familiar face on TV in the fight against COVID-19, Department of Health Undersecretary and Spokesperson Dr. Maria Rosario Vergere. To my very good friend, Dr. Eugene Jose F. Ramos, President and CEO of the Medical City, Dr. Anthony De Luzong, Assistant Division Chief, Division of Gastroenterology, Dr. Jose D. Celiano, Consultant for Gastroenterology, Dr. Jun R. Ruiz, Lead for Colorectal Cancer Screening, and Dr. Clarito Cairo, Cancer Control Program Manager of the Department of Health, and to all the participants of this colon cancer screening 2022 webinar. A pleasant morning to all of you. With both the National Integrated Cancer Control Act and the Presidential Proclamation Number 930 in place, this time is right for the Department of Health and the Medical City to promote an intensified observance of colorectal cancer awareness month this March. 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank the able leaders of the medical city for their sustained support to the programs of the Department of Health in putting an end to the health burdens caused by cancer. Our partnership that is strengthened through the years remains of immense significance in our fight against colorectal cancer. Since 2015, colorectal cancer has ranked third in cancer incidence and mortality among Filipinos, despite it being one of the most preventable and treatable kinds of malignancy. Further, data from PhilHealth Z benefit claims show that from 2016 and onward, there has been a rising trend in the number of colorectal cancer cases. This is why we need to step up our advocacy campaigns and step out with a population-based colorectal cancer screening using local immunochemical tests and colonoscopies for diagnostic and therapeutic management of colorectal cancer. We recognize that the COVID-19 pandemic has been a very challenging health crisis, which subsequently challenged different healthcare provision, including the screening of a preventable disease like colorectal cancer. However, we continue to remain steadfast in combating other diseases, notwithstanding the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. It is important to emphasize promoting awareness on cancer and other diseases in achieving health for all. We also recognize and appreciate the relentless efforts of our partners from the private sector in halting progressions of cancer. Our partnership over the years is a testament that with sustained collaboration, no disease is big enough to stop us from achieving good health for all. It is in this premise that we laud all your efforts in promoting campaigns and advocacies in the promotion of holistic health. As our plans and works for the national screening program are underway, know that the Department of Health is one with you in the vast endeavor as we work together to achieve the unified visions of Formula One for Health and universal health care of Filipinos being among the healthiest in Southeast Asia by 2022 and in Asia by 2040. As we continue to work hand in hand towards a better future for the Philippine public health, let us not falter from continually working with our communities towards the improvement of health and the betterment of everyday life of our Filipino people. Maraming salamat at mabuhay tayong lahat. Thank you, doctors. We are grateful to the Department of Health, the PSG, the PSCRS, and the PSMO in supporting our activity this year in the fight against colon cancer. Colorectal cancer ranks as the second cancer killer worldwide. It is also the third most common cancer in the Philippines. In 2020, an estimated 17,364 new patients were reported to be diagnosed with colon and rectal cancer. Colon Cancer Awareness is a massive worldwide campaign for colorectal cancer screening. It had its beginnings in the United States in the year 2000. After a decade, the Philippines joined this crusade and the medical city was among the pioneer institutions that promoted this advocacy. The medical city aims to be at the forefront in the fight against colon cancer and has been a champion in this advocacy for more than 10 years. We have been regularly celebrating colon cancer awareness campaign every year since 2014. Truly, it is a TMC tradition. In the beginning, we started in small lay forums for patient education given by our colorectal surgeons in one of the TMC conference rooms. Later, we organized multidisciplinary symposiums, including collaborations with five departments within TMC and the Department of Health. Our forums have become national platforms for trailblazing public health issues like Universal Health Care and National Integrated Cancer Control Act. We are the first and only advocacy group to present the colon balloon as a promotional tool for colon cancer patient education. 
Last year, with our first of its kind, joint international symposium with America's top HMO, Kaiser Permanente. We learn from Dr. Theodore Levine their best practices in cancer screening and the remarkable strategies during the pandemic. Our webinar was so well received and became the highest viewed TMC webinar watched by more than 10,000 patient partners. This premiere of this journey video highlights our beginnings, our growth, and achievements of the Medical City Colon Cancer Awareness Advocacy. Let the camera roll. Colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer in the world and in the Philippines. But with good screening programs and with highly specialized services, colorectal cancer is one of the most preventable and curable of cancers. For those reasons and with those objectives, TMC established its colorectal cancer screening program as well as its highly specialized colorectal clinic, which includes the stoma clinic and its enhanced recovery after surgery. As the lead for colon cancer screening advocacy since 2015, we organize projects, symposiums, and forums to spread this life-saving advocacy of screening among Filipinos to a much bigger audience. A first for this advocacy, three specialty sections of the medical city join forces to promote this cause among the doctors and our patient partners. We were the first in the private sector to collaborate with the Department of Health and then internationally with America's top HMO, Kaiser Permanente, in promoting colon cancer awareness in our celebrations and campaigns. Here at the TMC APSI, we have recently launched an organized cancer screening and prevention program, which we call Scrap Cancer Program, where we plan to go to our surrounding communities and teach and train barangay health workers and other stakeholders on the value of recognizing the early warning signs of cancer and of seeking health advice early on or on a regular basis once one reaches the age of risk. Colorectal cancer is screenable and preventable and this will certainly be included in our public health initiatives and programs like Scrap Cancer. Colorectal cancer is preventable, treatable, beatable. 
If you or your loved ones are at risk for colorectal cancer, visit us at the Medical City. Talk to one of our doctors about the screening process. What a journey it has been. This advocacy would not have happened were it not for the big support from Dr. Manuel Rojas, Dr. Trixie Chanco, Dr. Eugene Ramos, Dr. Rafael Claudio, and all of you doctors, our marketing staff, and our patient partners. We will have three speakers for a webinar and a joint Q&A session, which will be held at the end of the last lecture. For our viewers on Facebook, you can write your questions in the comment sections below, and we will try to answer your questions within the limited time available. The COVID-19 pandemic has been an unprecedented global health crisis that has severely challenged the provision of routine health care, including screening for colon cancer. Colon cancer screening almost stood still in most parts of the world during the early part of the pandemic. This interruption of screening in many countries had resulted in delayed diagnosis of colon cancer, showing a risk for advanced stage progression and poorer outcomes. Today's first lecture will be like a layman's 101 on colon cancer overview and the impact of the COVID pandemic in patient outcomes. Our first speaker is a colleague that I truly admire and have high respect for, a fellow graduate of the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. He is the Assistant Division Chief of Gastroenterology from the UPPGH, a former president of the Philippine Society of Digestive Endoscopy, and an active consultant of the section of gastroenterology here at the Medical City. Let us all welcome Dr. Mark Anthony Deluso. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me here to talk to you about colorectal cancer um, in this uh, March Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. So my lecture is about colorectal cancer. Uh, I'll just give an overview and its impact on its patient outcomes during the COVID pandemic. I have no disclosures uh, for this lecture. And for this uh, lecture, I'll talk to you about some epidemiology of colon cancer, give you some risk factors on why we have colon cancer, staging and um, touch up on the management of colon cancer. And as I've mentioned, I'll also discuss the effects of the COVID pandemic on colon cancer screening and colorectal cancer per se. At the end, I'll give you a short summary. So we all know this guy, Chadwick Boseman, who was uh, Black Panther during the Marvel um, uh, movies. Unfortunately, he died in August of 2020 uh, because of colon cancer. What's good about it is that because of his condition, he actually raised awareness for colon cancer. And this helped a lot in our fight against colon cancer. In the world, Global Can gave a, a very disturbing number for colon cancer in 2020, in which colon cancer now ranks fourth in the whole world in terms of incidence. And it's number five as the main cause of death for all of our cancers. In the Philippines, back in 2015, colorectal cancer was fifth among the most common cancers in our country. But it has now risen as the third most common cancer in 2020, also reported by Global Can. It means that 11.3% or one uh, out of the 10 cancer cases that we have is because of colorectal cancer. Looking at the sites of which colon cancer develops, just looking at this figure, you will note that almost three-fourths of colon cancer can arise from the left side of your colon, just near the anus, usually the sigmoid or descending colon. And when we see colon cancer patients, unfortunately, we see them more than half of the time at the late stages of the disease. 
And looking at this, 19% distant uh, cancer has metastasized or regional 37%. If you combine that, that's well, already 56% at least. It's very bad. The progression from a normal uh, colonic mucosa or the skin of our colon to becoming cancer and for it to spread has a lot of um, activities, uh, defects in our DNA, gene problems, etc. And this has been studied extensively. In general, it takes 5 to 20 years for a normal colon to develop full-blown colon cancer. And there's a lot of reasons behind this uh, growth. Thus, we discuss the risk factors for the development of colon cancer. The more prominent ones, there's a lot, but the more studied factors are number one, if you have an age of more than 50. Um, the older you are, the higher your risk of having colon cancer, but it generally starts at 50. If you have a higher consumption of alcohol or use of cigarette smokes, then again, it increases your risk for developing polyps and colon cancer. If you are obese, if your BMI is around 30 and above, if you lack physical exercise in which, in which uh, you don't move around at least 20 minutes a day, then you are at risk for col colorectal cancer. A diet low in fiber, such as high meat and then less fruits and vegetables, also can um, increase your risk for colon cancer. Things uh, that you cannot um, modify, unfortunately, it can also risks, uh, increase your risk for colon cancer. And these are a history of inflammatory intestinal conditions, specifically what we call the inflammatory bowel diseases, um, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. This increases your risk for colorectal cancer. Or if your family has a lot of people, your relatives, uh, your specifically first degree relatives have histories of colon cancer. I've mentioned the age at which colon cancer develops. It increases at the age of 50, um, even polyps. So in this table, you would see that it doesn't stop uh, at 50. So your risk increases at 50, but it increases further as you age, as you can see in this um, graph. And if polyps actually increase with, with age, then colon cancers will also increase with age because cancers generally come from these polyps. If you look at, as I've mentioned, the risk factors, which include family history, if you compare patients with family history of colon cancer and those without family history, and then you tabulate the age at which they uh, have colon cancers, you would note that people with a family history of colon cancer, earlier onset of colon cancers in their family. And if you have a first degree relative, or if that relative was diagnosed at less than age 45, or you have more than one relative who has colon cancer, then your uh, risk increases per the factors I've mentioned. The highest risk is if you have more than one relative who has colon cancer. So take note of this. What are the signs and symptoms of colon cancer? From a polyp to a uh, full-blown colon cancer, patients usually present as asymptomatic, meaning they don't present with any symptoms because most of the time, the, the mass hasn't grown big enough to cause obstruction or to bleed. And especially for patients who have only polyps, polyps won't cause, and the only clue that you may have a polyp is if you have a positive fecal occult test or a positive FIT test. But if ever you have symptoms, the most common signs and symptoms that are related to colon cancer are number one, change in bowel habits. You can have diarrhea or constipation, or you can have prolongation of your usual ritual. For example, you, you poop once a day, then after you have developed colon cancer, which you don't know, your bowel movement now can increase to once every two days, once every three days because of the obstruction of that mass. Since the tumor grows rapidly, 
it can cause necrosis, it can cause, cause bleeding. And thus, you can actually see blood in your stools. And it's usually admixed with your stool compared to uh, hemorrhoids in which you poop and then you bleed after moving your bowels. With colon cancer, the blood is usually mixed with the stools. Weight loss that is unexplained, you're not dieting, you're not intending to lose weight, is also one of the signs of colon cancer. So you have to take note of that. And finally, if you have persistent abdominal discomfort, not really pain, it's usually discomfort because of the uh, gas that is trapped or because your, your poop or your stools do not move properly and even some of your food is not moving properly because of the obstruction, you will feel some abdominal discomfort. We have to diagnose our colorectal cancer patients as early as possible. Catch them early, as much as possible in the polyp stage. Because as the stage goes um, higher, the survival of our patients gets lower. This five-year survival for colorectal cancer means that if you were, for example, diagnosed with a stage one cancer of colorectal cancer, after five years, 93% of the patients diagnosed with stage one are still alive after five years. Compared to a patient who was diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer, only 8% of those patients diagnosed with stage four will still be here today after five years. So what do we do to catch our patients at earlier stages? So we can have what we call screening tests or to catch colon cancer or polyps uh, if there are uh, polyps or cancers in the colon. You can have stool-based strategies which include FOBT, FIT or FIT DNA, or you can have direct visualization techniques in which they really look for masses or polyps like CT scans or what we call CT colonography, a flexible sigmoidoscopy or a colonoscopy. An FOBT is actually um, lesser compared to your FIT because an FOBT can detect any kind of blood, including animal blood. And that is why they ask you to diet, meaning you don't uh, eat uh, meat when you do the FOBT test. The FIT, on the other hand, is more specific for human blood. Thus, you don't have to diet, and it is better in terms of um, the compliance of our patients. The FIT DNA is a combination of the FIT plus testing for DNA um, uh, problems that are consistent with colon cancer. It is more expensive than your FIT. It works like your FIT, but it has um, not uh, being, become more popular because of its expense, because FIT is much, much more cheaper. For CT colonography, it's the same as the CT scan, but it, it images the colon more specifically, looking at masses or polyps in the colon. Problem is, it, it cannot detect accurately polyps less than five millimeters, sometimes even less than one centimeter. And if it detects something, and usually it's big, as I've mentioned, because it misses small lesions, then you still need sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy to double check and get biopsies from that uh, detected mass from CT colonography. So you're thinking now, sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy. Why do we need sigmoidoscopy and just do colonoscopy? Because as I've mentioned earlier, more than three-fourths of colon cancers occur in your left side of your colon. So just by doing flexible sigmoidoscopy in patients who does not want a full colonoscopy, because the difference is flexible sigmoidoscopy can be done outpatient without sedation compared to a full-blown colonoscopy, which is, which is usually done with colonoscopy because it's more uncomfortable. Then you can actually see at least 75% of the possible uh, polyps that will cause cancer in the future. And you still decrease the risk of you having colon cancer if you detect those polyps and remove them. But if you ask most gastroenterologists and physicians, these two are our bread and butters, and these two are the ones that we always recommend for you, our patients. Either you do a FIT every year. If it's positive, then you do colonoscopy. 
or I'll try to do colonoscopy uh, because in my opinion, this is much better. When you detect a polyp, then you're already there and then you remove it as well. So colonoscopy, as I've mentioned, is an instrument that has a camera at the tip with a flexible hose attached to a monitor or a TV. And then we actually see the insides of your colon and the walls of your colon, the mucosa of your colon, detecting masses, polyps, or any uh, abnormal lesions. The thing that we always look out for, especially in screening colonoscopy, screening colonoscopy is usually for patients who have no symptoms, but are usually aged 45 or 50 and above, we look for polyps. And from prior, I've discussed that polyps can become colon cancer in about a decade's time. And thus, if you remove the polyp, then you remove the chance for it to become cancer. This is what we call secondary prevention, meaning the growth is already there, but you stop it from progressing further, which is one of the basis on why colonoscopy is better than the rest of the tests. Again, if you find a polyp, this is how we remove it usually. We have a snare, which is usually a steel lasso that is connected to a cautery machine. We lasso the polyp, guillotine it at the base of the polyp, and then we cut it using cautery. Then we retrieve that polyp and then send it for histopathologic examination, checking for early cancer, pre-cancer, or even if it's benign. Why colonoscopy? It is the method of high sensitivity and specificity. It catches polyps and cancers very accurately because you can see them directly. And it both detects the pro-malignant or the pre-malignant lesions and even uh, lesions that are already malignant, as I've mentioned. And it is recommended by almost all international and national gastroenterology and cancer societies, including our own Philippine Society of Gastroenterology and Philippine Society of Digestive Endoscopy, as an initial, initial screening modality to check for uh, polyps and colon cancer. So colonoscopy, it's very important to prevent colorectal cancer. As I mentioned, it is a secondary prevention, and it can also be treatment. Meaning if we find a polyp that looks like a cancer, but it's superficial, when you do polypectomy, and that is already treatment, removing the cancerous polyp itself. It is recommended to be performed every 10 years for individuals of average risk, starting from age 45 to 50, which Dr. Soliano will discuss later if it's better to do it at 45 or still at 50, because nowadays, um, international societies are recommending to decrease the age of screening to 45. The 10-year uh, colonoscopy is applicable only if you have normal colonoscopy because based on the findings of your initial colonoscopy, then we do uh, scheduling of your next colonoscopy. If it's normal, then you do 10 years. But if you see polyps, it depends on the polyp. If the polyp is pre-malignant, then we could repeat the colonoscopy again in two to three years, after five years, or even after one year, depending on what the polyp uh, is on pathology. It is still the final common pathway for all of our screening tests, meaning if you have a positive FIT, then you do colonoscopy. If you have a positive CT colonography, then you do colonoscopy still. So it's still the final common pathway. There's optimism now because over the past 20 years, the death rate has been declining, which is good. And this has been attributed to improvements in screening and diagnostic modalities, better CT scans, etc., and even improvements in our medical and surgical treatment. Um, as I mentioned, there have been very significant effects of colonoscopy and polypectomy uh, in decreasing colon cancer. Looking at this study in the trends of five-year relative cancer survival rates for colon and rectum, you can see from the 1970s, 1980s, and early 2000s that survival rates have steadily increased, which is very good. And one of the people who have impacted um, the decrease in colon cancer uh, deaths and even increased colon uh, colonoscopies in the United States is this lady, Miss Katie Couric, who was a reporter 
And his, uh, her husband died of colon cancer. Because of that, she made it her adv advocacy to push for colon cancer screening and awareness. She then actually televised her own colonoscopy. And after that televised colon colonoscopy of hers, the rate for colonoscopy in the United States dramatically increased by at least 20%. That, that was the report. So even just one person can make an impact. So what do we do with colon cancers if we get them? It all is based on the staging. This is a TNM staging figure from the AJCC, which most of us use. And it starts with, of course, colonoscopy with biopsy. With the biopsy, if it determines that it, this is really colon cancer, then we do CT scans of the abdomen and the chest to look for metastasis. Because if we have metastasis or spread of the cancer to other parts of the body, including the chest and the abdomen, then it's already stage four or metastatic. We also do CEA to actually monitor the colon cancer and not to diagnose it. Sometimes we combine PET scans and CT scan to see the whole body to check for areas that could possibly have metastasis on top of doing your regular CT scan. The general management is if you have stage one, you can just remove it by surgery and then you don't need uh, chemotherapy. For stage two, you can do surgery with or without chemotherapy. Stage three usually comprises um, surgery plus chemotherapy. And finally, the management for stage four is more complicated. You can have chemotherapy alone, which is, which is usually pallet palliative, or you can have surgery, chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy or even metastasectomy, which is removal of metastasis if you're really aggressive, meaning re removing all of the possible masses that you can find and then combining it with chemotherapy. You can also give biologicals in which these um, treatment modalities target the receptors of cancers. For surgery, um, the general rule is if you have a tumor, that segment, including its blood supply, is removed, and then it is attached straight, anastomotic. Uh, that's what we call it. Or if you have a lesion that is near the rectum and it's near the anus, if it's less than five centimeters, usually five centimeters is the cutoff, and it, for example, you have a rectal uh, mass that is at four centimeters, then usually the surgeon will remove the rectum and part of the sigmoid, and then you will have a colostomy. A colostomy is a hole in your, in your abdomen in which the stools will go out of your abdomen instead of your anus because, again, the anus has been already uh, been affected by the mass, which is less than five centimeters. After treatment, after surgery, after chemotherapy, uh, this is applicable usually for stage one to three. Then we check for recurrence. And you have to remember the reason why your doctors, your oncologists, your surgeons, and your gastroenterologists do repeated colonoscopies, CT scans, CEAs, etc., in the first two to three years is because this is the time that recurrences occur in the first three years. So they have to be very vigilant in surveilling you for re, uh, recurrence of the colon cancer. Finally, let's talk about the effect of uh, the COVID pandemic on colorectal cancer screening. In our institution, the medical city, you have noted, we have noted that from pre-pandemic times to 2020 to 2021, even this year, there have been a dramatic drop in the number of our endoscopies. And in particular, look at colonoscopies in which in 2019, we were doing more than a thousand colonoscopies. And now they have dwindled to less than half. Even in my other hospitals that I work with, in NKTI, which is a government hospital, we do a lot of endoscopies reaching 3,000. Look at the numbers in 2020 and 2021. They have now dropped to just 1,000, which is one third of the usual numbers we have. The effect of the pandemic on screening for colorectal cancer is that since only symptomatic patients are now prioritized because they're saving the bed for COVID patients and asymptomatic patients, patients who are stable, these are uh, deferred or meaning they're they not admitted until they have more uh, pressing problems. 
And even the patients themselves tend to wait, then go to the hospital or to the emergency room because of the fear of getting COVID themselves. And telemedicine is now the norm, actually, during COVID than the face-to-face. So less and less people are being seen during their uh, earlier stages if they have colorectal cancer. And this delay in seeing these patients can mean more late stages being seen, more stage three and stage four cases being seen. And it, this does not um, mean just the patients, less doctors, because doctors are humans too. They can be affected with COVID as well, even the staff and the nurses, which means there also could be less rooms and endoscopy slots and endoscopy rooms that are available because there will be no uh, endoscopy staff that will be manning these areas or rooms because they had COVID or they were exposed to COVID, etc. And remember, there's also higher costs because in patients who are really needing endoscopies or colonoscopies, they need to have COVID swabs. Sometimes you have to screen them for clearance from cardiology and then from infectious disease and even from pulmonology, even before you can do your colonoscopy. This takes a toll on the patient's uh, financial capability. Thus, it brings lesser and lesser the frequencies of colonoscopies being done in the institution. And of course, this means lesser earnings for the hospital. As I've shown you here in National Kidney and Transplant Institute, um, they were earning 30 million almost in 2019. And then it dropped to 13.5 million in 2020 and 2021, 19.1 million. So what does this mean? So this means this drop now should be recovered because hospitals should earn so that they could keep on going. This will now be translated to the patients. So patients will now have to burden the additional costs for the protective personal equipments, um, additional costs for the screen like RT-PCRs, x-rays, and as I've mentioned, pulmo or IDS clearances on top of the cardio clearances. And some doctors even increase their professional fees because it's called hazard pay. They are now risking their lives in, in a COVID situation in which they could get the COVID themselves. So they increase their professional fees. Hospitals themselves also increase their procedural fees with the exact same uh, problem because their staff are now exposed. The, the staff are like overworked. So they have to pay more for these staff to stay because a lot of them actually resign because of this situation. This leads to, again, lesser and lesser number of patients able to, able to afford colonoscopy. How about training for colonoscopy? Because we already noted the drop in numbers, the difficulty of our patients uh, getting colonoscopy, the increasing cost. Now, how about the endoscopists themselves? We usually have a mentor-mentee type of training in which uh, the mentor does the colonoscopy while the mentee watches, and then eventually the mentee does it, and then you teach them while it, it's being done. It's a face-to-face -face type of training. But because of the problems of physical distancing and then lesser procedures, this has hampered colonoscopy training. What does this mean? It may mean that you will have inadequately trained endoscopists who will be doing your colonoscopy. Hopefully, this can be addressed soon by slowly uh, going back to the normal state before uh, the COVID pandemic. So in PGH, where I teach endoscopy, we change teaching of endoscopy from a usual face-to-face -face thing. It now has become virtual. Virtual meaning we combined all of the training institutions here and abroad and learn from each other virtually. Um, so you can see this, this is a Zoom picture. So different countries from Thailand, India, Japan. So then we actually did procedures and then taught each other's the tricks, uh, tips, and how to handle complications, etc. And this has in, uh, increased the knowledge sharing in our uh, institution. But 
if you look at it, if you teach, it's like this. There's only one or two persons in the room because, again, of COVID restrictions. And then he does it either with a simulator, just like what he's doing right now, or sometimes with a real patient, with the patient's consent, of course, and then we teach them virtually. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, Colon cancer is now the third most common cancer in the Philippines. It's actually the number one GI cancer in the Philippines and has overtaken liver cancer. Major risk factors that I mentioned include smoking and excess alcohol drinking, obesity and sedentary lifestyle, and an age more than 50, plus family history of colorectal cancer. So take note of that. Treatment is based on the stage of the cancer and usually includes surgery and chemo radiotherapy. The COVID pandemic has decreased the numbers of colonoscopy in our country, not just in this institution. It has delayed diagnosis of our colorectal cancer patient, patients and even their treatment. And it has decreased training opportunities for our budding endoscopists. But remember, instead of treating and detecting colon cancer, it might be better if we prevent it. Because prevention is still best. So eat a healthy, uh, have a healthy lifestyle, eat healthy, high-fiber diet, and of course, let us screen early. Talk to your physician, get evaluated, do, a, do an FIT. If it's positive, do colonoscopy, or outright have a colonoscopy, especially if you are more than 45 to 50 years old. Thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. So my last words are get the test so that we can get the polyp and then we can get the cure. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Delusong, for such a comprehensive discussion on the impact of COVID pandemic on patient outcomes. Due to increasing incidence of colon cancer in persons younger than 50, recent scientific data among American patients were reviewed. After the respective analysis, initially the American Cancer Society and followed by the United States Preventive Services Task Force changed its recommendation to begin screening average risk persons for colon cancer from age 50 down to 45. Americans have a much higher risk to colon cancer than Filipinos. We are also a low health resources country with only 491 board-certified gastroenterologists. Do we automatically adopt these American guidelines despite the big differences in genetics and national government health resources? This is the question that our second speaker will try to answer for us. Is 45 the new 50 in colorectal cancer screening? How feasible is it in the Philippines? Our second lecturer is a very in-demand professor and gastroenterology expert extraordinaire, highly respected locally and internationally. He's such a brilliant and accommodating mentor in gastroenterology. He is a professor of medicine from the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Medicine and Surgery, former president of the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology the Philippine Society of Digestive Endoscopy, the Hepatology Society of the Philippines, and the Philippine College of Physicians. He is also an active consultant from our section here at the Medical City. His achievements are too long to enumerate. It is indeed my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Jose Soliano. Good morning, and thank you very much for that kind of introduction. I do thank the organizing committee, especially Dr. June Lewis, for inviting me to this uh, webinar this morning. I'm going to speak on and deal on a question uh, 45 as the new 50 in colorectal cancer screening. Is that visible in the Philippines? As we all know, colorectal cancer has been in the forefront of the news, and of course, even in our Philippine politics, it has claimed one of our famous presidents, and therefore there's a lot of awareness on colorectal cancer in this country. And of course, the, the statistics for this particular cancer is kind of disturbing. Uh, these arrows tell us a, 
um, the direction of going up to the north and the incidence of colorectal cancer in the Philippines, and therefore it is a clear and present danger. Uh, this is one uh, tornado uh, map that uh, shows uh, the Philippines as a one of the major countries where colorectal cancer is increasing uh, in incidence and prevalence, and uh, it seems that there's more uh, colorectal cancers in the male compared to the female Filipinos. Uh, we know that colorectal cancer has a lot of risk factors. We have spoken that in many fora in the past. Um, it is important to emphasize, however, that smoking, alcohol, the consumption of red meat, especially fatty food, obesity, and uh, maybe even diabetes is part of those risk factors that are enumerated in many of the literatures printed on colorectal cancer. Your family history is also very important because there is a familial risk uh, related to colorectal cancer. Uh, today, March is a, the Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month for uh, the Philippines and I think around the world. And so I think uh, the Medical City Group is uh, embarking again on this awareness for colorectal cancer detection and hopefully awareness that is going to last for the lifetime of uh, the way that we are going to deal with colorectal cancer in this country. Uh, what is nice with colorectal cancer is uh, the fact that it has a pre-existing condition that is benign and uh, can be detected early so that you can prevent it. And therefore, this topic about colorectal cancer screening is very important. It has, in this pre-malignant condition, it has a long and asymptomatic natural history. And therefore, if we present ourselves to our physicians, then we can have the advantage and the benefit of colorectal cancer screening. Uh, it usually starts from an adenoma, which is benign, and therefore, uh, when you do a certain procedures to detect them early, you'll be able to get the uh, diagnosis early and therefore intervene uh, as early as you can. Here is, for example, the classic adenoma carcinoma sequence in picture. On the left is a big adenoma or a big polyp in the colon. It's pedunculated usually, and this is benign. Uh, warning, however, is that if these polyps are large enough, like, like two centimeters in diameter or more, the chance that you get a rectal cancer in this little piece of uh, polyp is as, much, as high as 47%, so almost like 50%. And therefore, uh, when you subject yourself to a colonoscopy as one of your screening uh, modalities, then these polyps are detected and are removed endoscopically, and you will prevent a colorectal cancer from happening. The one on the right is, of course, the late manifestation of this polyp. It has degenerated into a malignant uh, mass, and therefore here on the right is a catastrophic um, sequela of the polyp that should have been removed earlier on. This is the criteria for a good screening program or a, the basis for a good screening program that is promoted by WHO. Um, here enumerated is the cancers or conditions where it is common in the community and there's a diagnostic procedure that can be done, which can be easily accessible by patients and cheap enough or affordable enough uh, to be uh, paid for by either government or the general public and it can detect very, very uh, convincingly and very uh, unequivocally the malignancy or the early uh, pre-malignant condition so that you will be able to intervene early and the treatments are available in the same community, then it is a good condition to have a screening program because in this way, uh, we shall have a very effective and maybe, maybe even a cost-effective way preventing a condition or a malignancy in this context. Uh, the secret, however, or the major backbone, however, of a good screening program is not only cost and availability, but of course also a very good recall program, meaning that in patients where you are able to detect a suspicion for a neoplasm or a benign uh, pre-malignant neoplasm, you have a very effective recall system so that Patients who test positive for this screening test should be called up and sent back to the facility in order to have the additional testing that might lead to the histopathologic documentation of the neoplasm, as well as, of course, the treatments that are available in that particular facility. 
So a screening program is not a simple availability of certain tests, some infrastructure uh, that is uh, already in place, but of course also a very, very uh, pragmatic, but of course a very, very effective way of detection, recall, and of course intervention. Early intervention, of course, is already a no-brainer. This uh, particular graph is going to tell us that the earlier you detect uh, cancer of the colon or polyps or the precancerous polyps in the colon, the higher is going to is, uh, survival of patients with uh, colorectal cancer risks. It must be emphasized, therefore, that if you have a very good screening program or if you subject your um, group or your uh, people to a good colorectal cancer uh, screening program, up to 60% of colon cancer deaths can be prevented by a very effective screening uh, infrastructure. Uh, in 2008, we attempted to write a, a consensus recommendation for the Asia Pacific. This was spearheaded by Joseph Sung. As you can see, Professor Lieberman from the American Cancer Society had been involved in this particular uh, endeavor. And we said, that in 2008, the colorectal cancer screening uh, age should begin at 50. And this is basically in cadence with also the recommendations in the West. Uh, so that until about 2018, until 2019, almost all the campaign for colorectal cancer screening had been uh, on, on patients who are in between 50 and 75. And of course, uh, older than 75, you have to go on a case-by-case -case basis. And clearly, uh, at 85 or more, uh, we have discouraged the uh, screening programs for this age group because there is really no benefit or survival benefit that follows a colorectal cancer screening uh, intervention in this particular age group. So the key age, therefore, until 2018 and 2019 is 50. Um, there was a good article that was written in this uh, in this. Age cut off by the uh, published in the Annals of uh, Internal Medicine. What is important and uh, the good basis for this 50 is basically in the, reflected in this particular graph. Uh, they have shown and analyzed that at 50, you're actually be able to get the survival benefit uh, at a more cost-effective manner by screening patients uh, at starting at 50. If you start at 60, you have you almost basically have the same um, the same benefit, and uh, maybe if you even uh, screen up a little earlier, uh, it will be maybe more costly. But the, with the fact that uh, when you have patients being screened at an early age and you don't get the uh, polyps that you want to detect, then you would probably spend most uh, for more money. Um, what is therefore important in this uh, particular paper is the fact that epidemiological data which tells us that most polyp starts at 50 and therefore if you start screening at the age 50 then you'll be able to pick up uh, the early pre-neoplastic or pre-cancerous lesions and be able to intervene and remove those lesions and therefore reduce the risks of colorectal cancer among your patients. In the Philippines we attempted also to make our colorectal cancer uh, consensus uh, recommendations. And in 2017, we came up with this particular document. And uh, based on the Asian data, because really we don't have uh, Philippine data, based on the Asian data, we also concluded that screening should start at 50, because this is the time that patients, at least in the Asia Pacific region, also starts to demonstrate uh, polyp formation or polyp detection in the uh, cohort that has been uh, scope in this particular age group. And we said that routine CRC screening for patients beyond 75 should be individualized depending on their life expectancy and of course the associated risks that will follow after a colonoscopy or an FOBP. Now, when you talk about cancer screening, there's there are actually two concepts today about screening uh, procedures uh, in the context of cancer screening. One, of course, is uh, preventive screening, where the screening tests are aimed at detecting the still benign cancer precursors, like uh, what we have emphasized in the beginning, say a benign polyp uh, that is detected by the screening test. Early detection screening is 
it's a program where the screening tests cannot reliably detect benign cancer precursors, but still aim to detect invasive cancers or at an early stage. Basically saying that you can perhaps do a program where the detection uh, will only bring in patients, or the test will only bring in patients. Uh, they're not as reliable as uh, one would, would, would expect. However, if there is some way that you can uh, uh, pick up some of these patients, then uh, at least the patients will have still at an early stage of their malignancies. Now, these are the screening tests that are available today. Uh, what we have is uh, the cheap, uh, you know, guayac, uh, called blood test. We basically have discarded the guayac uh, fecal or blood test as already passe. And what we recommend today is the fecal immunochemical test because this is a test in the stools that can detect human hemoglobin in blood. There are also more expensive uh, DNA examinations that are available in America. And in fact, they're being offered as well in the Philippines. But clearly, these are very tedious and very difficult to collect and maybe culturally not acceptable. Uh, there are also serologic examinations like your CEA levels, which uh, are not very reliable when patients are getting them at an early uh, or the tests are being done in a stage where still the pre-malignant conditions are seen because they are not elevated in these uh, particular individuals. Of course, you have also major sophisticated machines like uh, the CT scan or the MRI. Of course, we have endoscopy. And of course, we have uh, both fiber optic and uh, and uh, video endoscopies today, as well as, of course, capsule endoscopies, which are a little bit more expensive than the usual endoscopies that we know. In the New England Journal of Medicine, they have just uh, published this particular uh, concept about screening in colorectal cancer. And here, for example, they have enumerated preventive screening, the advantages of that, early detection screening, and of course, the value of this in detecting polyps in the stage where we want them to be. And so the major advantage, I think, of uh, endoscopy as a preventive screening strategy is the fact that um, it will really bring down the incidence of colorectal cancer and, of course, the mortality related to colorectal cancer. And clearly, uh, we'll have a very, very bad disadvantage of detecting or overusing colonoscopy as a screening test because this is so easy to do. And because there is a monetary or a pecuniary gain um, being um, being in favor of the, the people who will do colonoscopy, then the tendency for abuse is there. Fecal testing, of course, as an early detection screening um, will decrease colorectal mortality, or colorectal cancer mortality. However, overall mortality may not, as they have been proven by the big trials done in America using the FIT test. What is important in this uh, group of uh, cohorts of patients that are um, being tested, however, for a colorectal cancer screening program is that once there is a program that is available in the community, and as long as the patients are able to do this and the funding is, um, is good enough that is uh, uh, being uh, subsidized by either government or certain agencies of government, then a colorectal cancer screening will have benefits in mortality and of course, early detection. And uh, I think that's very good enough. Uh, when there is a, uh, a risk of increasing the testing of, or, or the pickup of uh, certain conditions that are not really related to colorectal cancer, I suspect that in the end of the day, uh, that is still money well spent. In this particular consensus that we had in 2008, we said that fecal occult blood tests, especially the immunochemical test, flexible sigmoidoscopy, and of course colonoscopy can be recommended as a screening test for colorectal cancer. However, because we realize that in Asia, the economics of the different nations composing the Asia Pacific region is so varied, I think it is just pragmatic that the most inexpensive way, but the most helpful way of detecting uh, polyps, uh, which is basically the immunohistochemical test um, based um, fecal occult blood is the recommendation of our group. Now, among us who are listening and we are doing endoscopies, 
uh, we would like to then to go for colonoscopy because we know that in colonoscopy, uh, you will only not only detect the polyp, but you can also remove the polyp in the, at the same time when you detect them. And so you can have certain uh, statements that go this way. Colonoscopy is not only detect the disease, but prevent cancer because they can remove the precancerous polyps uh, during the procedure. Uh, while that is the bias, I think the cost-effective analysis that are available today in the world tells us that, yes, colonoscopy can be an effective way to detect polyps, but the difficult of all that is as slowly as they can, as long as they are culturally acceptable to the community where you are going to do the stool test, I think that's still the most cost-effective way of testing for colorectal cancer. What is most important, how, uh, in fact, is that when you are going to do colonoscopy, it is going to be a good quality colonoscopy because uh, we need to firstly give our efforts and focus on colonoscopy, uh, doing colonoscopy on patients who are maybe at an increased risk, especially those with uh, in, uh, first degree relatives who had already developed a colon cancer for those patients who have already had several bouts of uh, uh, rectal bleeding or maybe even have some elevations of uh, their CEAs already that, that has been documented in the past. And there are also issues about uh, us endoscopists doing really bad colonoscopy. And so because we realize that, we basically emphasize in statement number 15 that colonoscopy should be good quality colonoscopy. And a good quality colonoscopy is not only good quality colonoscopy during the colonoscopy, but also a good quality of the preparation of the colon before doing colonoscopy. As, and the last part, of course, is the meticulous survey, visual survey of the entire colonic long lumen so that you'll be able to detect the polyps as you would like them to be in a good screening program. So I don't know who in the Philippines have an industry audit in their centers and for us of course, who are listening to this talk and are the managers of colonoscopy centers in your locality or in your institution, I would, I would like to remind everyone that endoscopy audits, especially colonoscopy audits, uh, should be made on a regular basis. The most important is that I think all of your endoscopies should have their own uh, ratings for adenoma detection because those people who are not having a very good adenoma detection rate should have a retraining. Very difficult as it is, very nasty as it sounds, but I think if our ADRs are very bad, then we need to have a good re reorientation of our colonoscopy techniques. Now, we have been talking about um, stool tests, we have been talking about colonoscopies, we have been talking about maybe uh, uh, some more expensive examinations, but I am struck by this particular article that I read uh, in the preparation for this talk. Uh, rather than focusing on which test is best, physicians should ensure that all eligible patients undergo some type of colorectal cancer screening by any method that is available in the community. And I would like to make sure that this statement is remembered today. Now, of course, uh, the title of my talk is, can we bring this down to 45 uh, from 50? Uh, this has been the recommendation in the West, in the American context, uh, because they have been showing data lately that um, polyps and even some cancers are already detected in patients as, high, as young as 45. The truth is in this center of mine, for example, this last week, we already had two polypect, uh, we had two uh, people who had, had a colonoscopy. One was at 48 and one was at 46 who had already colorectal cancer. To me, however, this seems to be a little bit the uh, information that are on the outliers, because clearly most of our patients, even in this pandemic, when they come in late for the symptoms uh, to have a colonoscopy, we still detect them at an age where most of them are beyond 50. So there's data in America today which shows that colorectal cancer and maybe colorectal polyps are already seen in patients who are at age 45, and therefore the recommendation, at least in their particular uh, communities was to start uh, colorectal cancer screening at age 45. So is it possible and feasible in the Philippines? Um, Harry Potter doesn't know. He says, I don't know. Homer also doesn't know. And therefore, what is the data? The truth is that we don't have data to support a diagnosis or a recommendation that we need to bring this down to 45. 
Um, we don't also have the infrastructure and clearly we don't have the funds. I think we need to have a survey or we need to have data to produce and demonstrate to the government that yes, to our colleagues, for example, in the GI community, to the surgeons around us, that there is an increase already of patients with polyps at age 45. We also don't know, we don't have cost effectiveness studies on whether the use of the immuno uh, the immunochemical test or the colonoscopy or the CT scan are the more cost effective ways of doing this. Unless we have those cost effective studies, uh, we will not be having a very good recommendation to base upon. We don't also have the infrastructure. Uh, I don't know how many or how much is an IOF OBD in this in this country. Uh, the cost for colonoscopy is so variable. The professional fees of the gastroenterologists are also variable. So these are data that we need in order for us to really make a sensible and uh, very good recommendation so that this can be either funded by government or funded from pockets. And clearly because funds are an issue um, in this uh, last three years uh, that the pandemic has really overwhelmed everybody. I really don't know where the funds will be coming from, even if the uh, patients have money to spend out of their pockets, maybe colorectal cancer screening will not be the first in the priority. As I spoke in the last uh, conference of the society, there are only about maybe 480 endoscopies available for 100 and maybe already now 110 million Filipinos. So how can we answer the screening demand for fetal cancer if there are only 500 endoscopies to service 110 million Filipinos? So we need to step up and put up all these infrastructures, all this funding and all this design and protocols uh, for colorectal cancer screening. And we have warm bodies to respond to this call uh, now in the future. So at the moment, I suspect uh, we don't have those uh, numbers that will be able to uh, man the colonoscopy centers, the testing centers, and therefore it's going to be a very difficult question to answer. One thing, however, is that the DOA, so the, the Department of Health has already made a pilot study. They're doing one pilot study in, new, new, uh, in the East Avenue Medical Center today. I think there's one as well in the provinces. Uh, so that we'll be able to get a, a good feel of what we can do in colorectal cancer screening and the data that's going to come out from those pilot studies are going to be very, very crucial in our decision to implement a program and implement a program that will bring down the uh, age of colorectal cancer screening to 45. By and large, therefore, uh, our situation is really very dire. Uh, we don't have data, we don't have uh, funding, we don't have um, all the answers for real, very difficult questions on how to run a very effective, effective and a cost-effective colorectal cancer screening in the Philippines in 2022. Now, clearly there are patients or there are patient groups that might benefit from a colorectal cancer screening that is below 50. In the 2014 iteration of this updated Asia-Pacific consensus recommendations, we still recommended the screening age to be 50 uh, in the updated article. And we identified, of course, that in patients uh, who have first degree relatives um, where the colorectal cancer is high um, or the risk is high, then maybe these patients will have to be uh, screened earlier. Um, this is a statement that is reflecting that first degree relatives of patients uh, with sporadic CRCs diagnosed less than 50 are at increased risk of colorectal neoplasm and therefore an early screening is warranted. And the recommendation is always that the, st the start of the age of this uh, first degree relative should be 10 years before the earliest cancer that is seen in that particular pedigree. So therefore today, if you're gonna ask me, uh, can we bring it down to 45? He does not know, and of course, maybe I still don't know the correct answer. I'd like to thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll be ready to answer questions in the open forum. Thank you very much again.
Thank you very much, Dr. Soliano, for such a comprehensive and convincing opinion on the issue whether 45 being the new 50 or we just stick to 50 in the Philippine medical setting. It is always a delight to listen to your lectures, Professor. Your talk sets the stage for the discussion of the final lecture where we will be hearing the actual health cancer care program situation in the real world from the Department of Health. It has been three years since a successful passage of the twin health bills, the Universal Health Care Act, the National Integrated Cancer Control Act, or NICA. The good news about NICA is that PhilHealth is expanding its benefit packages to include primary care screening, detection, diagnosis, treatment, supportive care, and end-of-life care for all types and stages of cancer in both adults and children. As a patient advocate, the passage of these landmark bills was a personal big moment for me, as the TMC community listened just days after signing to Congressman Helen Tan in 2019. It has been an uphill battle for the government to implement colon cancer screening in the Philippines. There's still no official national population-based colon cancer screening program in the country. But this may change this year. Our final speaker will be talking about how the Department of Health plans in closing the gaps in colorectal cancer care among Filipinos. He and I have worked in special health projects in the past. He's the medical officer for and the program manager of the Department of Health Disease Prevention and Control Bureau. May we call on to the virtual stage, Dr. Clarito Cairo Jr. Good morning, everyone. I'll be presenting to you Closing the Care Gaps in Colorectal Cancer Care Among Filipinos. So uh, at the end of my presentation, you still have uh, further questions. You can email me at cucairo at doh.gov.ph. So in light of the implementation of the National Integrated Cancer Control Act, or the Republic Act number 11215, uh, we need to follow the Strategic Action Plan 2021 to 2030. And uh, part and parcel of that plan is the closing the care gaps along the cancer continuum. And uh, you see in my slide, this is the end-to-end -end continuum from access to primary prevention, access to right information, uh, all the way to access to optimal treatment and care. So let's start with access to primary prevention. So in here, the Department of Health will focus on the, the healthy habits, the risk factors for cancer. So uh, as they say, prevention is cheaper than cure. So the Department of Health will lead in strengthening the risk factors for cancer should be addressed, like uh, tobacco use, harmful use of alcohol, physical inactivity, and uh, unhealthy diet. And of course, exposure to air pollution, exposure to uh, chemical carcinogens. And we need to uh, share the right information to our uh, countrymen. The Department of Health has this Todo Pito advocacy campaign where we address the seven healthy habits. And uh, due to time constraint, I cannot uh, discuss to you uh, the seven healthy habits one by one. So we have the healthy population. They will benefit from this advocacy on uh, access to primary prevention. And then we have another set of population, the at-risk population. So uh, for colorectal cancer, we are talking here of uh, 50 years old and above. So we will uh, advocate access to early detection. So when we say access to early detection, we're talking of uh, screening for the asymptomatic and the early diagnosis for the symptomatic. And uh, we are talking here also of uh, a fecal immunochemical test for the screening uh, test 
and uh, we will launch that uh, this March as a part of the Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month celebration. Another one, we have the access to complete diagnosis. So, hindi po nagtatapos no? sa, sa screening or sa, sa colonoscopy kasi kailangan magka-colonoscopy na ating mga pasyente. Madami pa pong work up sa ang papagawa sa pasyente, uh, especially to rule out metastasis. So, to complete the diagnosis, kailangan po nating uh, sagutin din yung iba pang tests na sabihin nating covered naman ng PhilHealth and yung iba pwedeng may out-of-pocket expenses pa si pasyente. So kailangan din nating tulungan yung pasyente para hindi na po siya mag-out-of-pocket expenses. And uh, after that, makompleto na po yung diagnosis, susunod na po yung access to treatment and care. And uh, of course, iba-ibang modalities of treatment like uh, surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and uh, kung uh, kailangan pa nga po yung palliative care, yan na tinatawag. Across the continuum, uh, nina-address po natin yung different uh, types of population. And yung sinasabi natin sick population, uh, yan po yung uh, focus ng ating uh, assistance na binibigay sa Department of Health at malalaman siya po, po mamaya no, yung iba-ibang assistance na binibigay namin. And of course, kasama din po yung cancer registry. Mala, mahalaga po yung data na nag-generate natin sa registry, especially po sa ating policy development and at program management. And yung patient navigation. Uh, dapat po uh, yung ating mga pasyente, ma ma-navigate po sila, mag-guide po sila kung uh, saan po sila let's say, magpapascreen, saan po sila magpapakolonoscopy, and saan po nila makukompleto yung workups, yung therapeutics. Yun po yung patient navigation. Pwedeng from the community up to the hospital. Yan, yun po yung uh, gagawin natin dyan. And of course, yung research and development. Medyo po lang po tayo sa local studies, lalo na po sa colorectal cancer. So uh, sa paglo-launch po natin ng uh, uh, screening test or mass screening test using FIT uh, this March or April, kung di man na uh, abutin, magkakaroon po tayo ng implementation research. Uh, abangan po natin yan kasi yan po nga yung kulang natin dito sa ating uh, bansa. And yung ating uh, timeline, sabi nga po natin sa strategic plan, we will do it in phases. Hindi po talaga yan uh, one time, big time. So we have the timeline of the National Integrated Cancer Control Program. Sa so phase one from 2021 to 2024, uh, that's the starting up of the program. And then phase two, Uh, we have the, to strengthen the program and then phase three, scaling up of the program and uh, last phase would be beyond uh, 2030, sustaining and uh, continuing improvement of the program. Ito po yung guide natin sa, sa ating uh, National Integrated Cancer Control Program, uh, yung vision, uh, cancer-free Philippines, that is Philippines free from the burden of uh, cancer. Uh, especially po yung ating mga pasyente at kanilang pamilya ay mabawasan man lang no yung kanilang uh, burden na uh, with regards sa financial uh, aspect and then sa mission uh, people uh, patient and family centered healthcare so uh, dapat po yung system natin uh, accessible and uh, equitable and uh, of course uh, inclusive So that means wala pong may iwan, may uh, access po yung mahirap at mayaman sa ating pong uh, healthcare services. And then in goal, by 2030, at least uh, 50% of all Filipino cancer patients uh, will have equitable access to comprehensive cancer care services, thereby reducing by 10% the overall mortality from cancer by 2030. So ito po, ito po yung ating uh, blueprint na tinatawag. At uh, lahat po ng ating uh, priority cancers ay uh, ito po yung magiging guidance. In this slide, we have the Cancer Assistance Fund as uh, indicated in the National Integrated Cancer Control Act or the Cancer Law, uh, particularly Section 20 of the Implementing Rules and Regulations. To address the gaps, we need to address the following access. Three access. Access to diagnosis access to therapeutic procedures, and access to medications. Discuss po natin yung access to diagnostics. So dyan po magpo-follow yung screening and early diagnosis, 
uh, yung ating uh, complete diagnosis na na-discuss na ko na kanina and yung cancer surveillance. Saan po yung series of follow-up tests para malaman po natin kung nag-respond uh, successfully yung pasyente sa treatment niya. So, uh, kailangan din po natin uh, i-cover ano no? I -i kasi pag wala nga hong uh, follow-up test, paano natin malalaman kung talagang gumaling na yung pasyente? And usually, ho, hindi po nakocover ng PhilHealth yan. Kaya using the Cancer Assistance Fund, may bibigay na po tayong uh, assistance sa mga pasyente. Bali, ito po yung uh, first and foremost yung FIT, yung fecal immunochemical test. First time po nating uh, gagawin yan, magkakaroon na po ng access to screening yung ating eligible population na, na 50 years old and above. Bali, ang gagamitin po natin yung pang public health, yung automated and quantitative. Uh, hindi po yung uh, the usual na manual and qualitative kasi ho, uh, paisa-isa po yan. So mas makakatipid po tayo kung automated and quantitative, pang malakihan, talagang uh, may selected hospitals po. And yung ating mga kababayan na eligible ay pwede po silang magpa-test using that fit and uh, nandun naman din po yung machine. And wala po silang out of pocket expenses. And sa mga magpa-positive po sa, sa fit, uh, kailangan po silang mag-undergo ng colonoscopy. At ang colonoscopy ay uh, pwede pong libre under ng uh, malasakit center or even field health. Sagot po yan ng field health, uh, pasok po sa kanilang case rate. And uh, yan po yung ating gagawin na uh, starting, hopefully nga mahabol ngayong March, pero kung hindi naman na uh, April. And uh, sa mga iba pang uh, diagnostic procedures or tests, uh, pwede na po siyang ma-avail sa, sa mga hospitals kung saan may malasakit centers. Uh, ongoing na po yan, no? dahil uh, that's part of the mandate of malasakit center. And uh, itong cancer assistance fund, gagamitin din po yan uh, sa iba pang uh, diagnostic tests for cancer na ma-avail po sa selected uh, exercise namin. Ayun po yung ginagamit namin sa Medicines Access Program sa mga libreng gamot. Bali, ang priority cancers po namin itong mga sumusunod ay yung breast cancer, childhood cancers, and then uh, lung cancer, head and neck cancers, blood cancers, yung lymphoma, leukemia, myeloma, and then yung gastrointestinal cancers like colorectal cancer, liver cancer, and then yung uh, gynecologic cancers like cervical, ovarian, and then finally, prostate, renal, and bladder cancers. Wala na po kayong magiging problema pagdating po sa gastusin dahil lang po yung, yung budget namin uh, starting this year ay uh, yung tinatawag namin Cancer Control Assistance Program. And on top of that, may malasakit center pa po tayo uh, para pandagdag po sa mga gastusin. And another access, yung access to therapeutic procedures. So alam naman po natin na hindi po lahat uh, nakocover ng PhilHealth a portion of that, di ba, uh, out of pocket. So yung out of pocket, pwede po namin sagutin using Cancer Assistance Fund. And uh, madalas yung outpatient, hindi din po nakocover ng field health. So kami din po, uh, nasa guidelines na nagawa na namin, uh, sasagutin namin uh, yung uh, outpatient procedure, let's say outpatient na colonoscopy, in case na hindi i-cover ng field health, kami po ang bahalang sumagot yan. And uh, yung iba pang therapeutic procedures na akala yung uh, out of, na, dahil nga hindi covered ng field health or ng malasakit, partial lang, yung sagot nila, sasagutin po natin ng buo. Nang sa gayon po ay hindi na mahirapan ang ating mga pasyente at kanilang pamilya. And last po, uh, sa ating uh, gaps, yung access to medications. Sa government po kasi, may uh, tinatawag the Philippine National Formulary. Pag wala po sa Philippine National Formulary mga gamot, hindi po mapoprocure ng government, ng DOH. So, kung hindi po mapoprocure ng Department of Health, eh di hindi po natin mabibigay ng libre sa mga pasyente natin. So, lahat po ng uh, wala pa sa Philippine National Formulary, uh, yun po yung ipoprocure natin using the Cancer Assistance Fund at uh, maa-avail po siya ng libre sa selected uh, DOH hospitals or tinatawag nating access sites. Itong mga nasa listahan ngayon ay uh, partial pa lang po yan, hindi pa yan final, kinoconsult pa po namin yung ating mga specialists kung ano po yung mga priority medicines na wala pa sa Philippine National Formulary.
And uh, of course, uh, ang pinaka goal po natin, sabi ko nga kanina, mabawasan po yung ating mga pasyente na namamatay sa cancer, lalo na yung mga preventable and treatable cancers like colorectal cancer. Ways forward po tayo, ngayong nasa alert level 1 na po tayo sa Metro Manila, uh, we need to live with the virus. So uh, ang Department of Health ay in-implement din po yung tinatawag na full devolution. Yung uh, Mandana's Garcia ruling na tinatawag, pinalaki pa ho no, yung, yung budget ng ating local government units. And asahan nyo po, uh, pwede po nilang uh, ma-prioritize ang cancer. Uh, gumawa lang po sila ng ordinance. And pwede na po nilang uh, simulan yung uh, pagkakanda po ng uh, screening and uh, other services for cancer using their own budget. Kasi nga, devolve ang ating healthcare system, pwede po silang mag-initiate ng uh, any programs na sabi natin kung hindi pa ginagawa ng national, pwede sila ang magsimula. So we need to strengthen their capacity. And of course, sa new normal, Reinforce pa rin po natin yung ating minimum public health standards. Uh, wag po tayo maging complacent. Uh, hopefully, uh, hindi na po bumalik yung... <laughs> I mean, hindi na talaga mag-evolve pa yung... I mean, with the new variants na tinatawag, uh, tuloy-tuloy na po yung ating recovery sa, sa new normal. And next, yung resilience. So, kailangan po natin enhance yung ating uh, capacity uh, na mag-respond if ever na may panibagong pandemic na naman. And of course, dapat tuloy-tuloy yung services na binibigay natin sa, sa cancer. Kung maga, hindi lang tayo nakafocus sa, sa COVID-19, for example, dapat tuloy-tuloy po yung binibigay nating services. Hindi po mapuputol. Ayun uh, po yung resilience. And uh, pang-apat po yung partnership. Kaya nga po, uh, nagpapasalamat kami dahil may mga ganitong uh, avenue kung saan uh, naikakampaign po ng DOH yung mga uh, ginagawa po namin. Kasi uh, isipin po ng iba na nakafocus lang po kami sa COVID-19 pandemic pero sa katunayan uh, pinagtutunan din namin ng pansin ang ibang sakit na may talagang malaking burden like cancer. Uh, sa katunayan tinasan pa ho ng budget ng cancer uh, kahit na pandemya. Kumbaga from uh, dati ho no, wala pang cancer law, nasa 200 million plus lang yung budget sa mga gamot. Pero ngayon 2021, last year, kasagsagan po ng pandemya, ginawa pong uh, 756 million pesos para sa mga libreng gamot. At ngayon pong 2022, hindi lang po libreng gamot, pati po yung libreng diagnostics and other therapeutic procedures and medications. So may 529 million pesos po kami dyan na ibibigay po sa selected hospitals at doon po nyo ma-avail ng libre yung mga sinabi po nating uh, diagnostics and therapeutics. And of course, uh, lastly, yung advocacy. Sabi nga nila, advocacy will lead to action. So kailangan po natin immobilize yung communities, yung ating mga frontliners sa baba, uh, sa ating uh, barangay health stations, or health units. Uh, Sama-sama po tayo, syempre mga stakeholders, mga experts, let's say mga doctors natin, uh, dapat uh, mag-conduct po ng mga lectures, ng mga lay fora, and uh, encourage po natin yung ating kababayan na mag, uh, mag-screen, lalo na po sa colorectal cancer, kasi nga ho, uh, it's preventable, it's treatable, and beatable. Isa lang po ang colorectal cancer sa, sa mga cancers na talagang umahaba po yung buhay ng pasyente na kumbaga wala po dapat mamatay kasi andyan po yung mga procedures na pwedeng gagaling po yung pasyente. Yun po ha, gagaling po talaga. Uh, wag lang talagang ma-detect na medyo late na. Late stage na po yung, yung cancer. Kaya yun po, uh, ito po yung ways forward ng ating uh, cancer control program sa, at sa bu- buong Department of Health. So that's all uh, for me and uh, thank you very much everyone. Good morning to our distinguished speakers, to our guests and patient partners. Thank you to Dr. Delusong, Professor Soliano, and Dr. Cairo for giving us excellent and stimulating lectures on the different facets of colon cancer management. Congratulations. Let us all give them a big round of applause. I would like to thank our partners for this webinar, the Department of Health, in particular, the Communication Management Unit, especially to Mr. Joram, 
the office of Undersecretary Maria Rosario Verguere, uh, Nagasi Philippines Corporation, Westmont Pharmaceuticals, especially to Mr. Patrick Villanueva, Philippine Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons, the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology. Thank you very much, everyone. It does take a village to move forward to this advocacy. Just to summarize, Dr. Lusong provided the basics on colon cancer and how the pandemic severely affected colon cancer screening, specifically in the performance of colonoscopies. Professor Soliano, on the other hand, convinced us why the new screening age of 45 may not be applicable in the Philippine medical setting from the standpoints of epidemiology, patient-specific factors, and from government resources. On a positive note, Dr. Cairo is happy to announce that we will have a national colon cancer screening program and it's in the works soon. We hope to get more details from him. Welcome to our Q&A session. Let us all welcome back our doctors to the virtual stage, Dr. De Luzong, Professor Soliano, and Dr. Cairo. We are so excited to have this panel discussion since we know we will have interesting and thought-provoking conversations. A reminder to our audience, you can still write your questions on the Facebook comments below. Uh, the first question goes to Dr. De Luzong. During the pandemic, there was understandably a reduction in colonoscopy procedures. As you mentioned, and supported by medical articles, there was a delay in cancer diagnosis leading to advanced stage cancers. FIT, which stands for fecal immunochemical test, is the other main method for screening for colon cancer. Do you think physicians should have promoted FIT as the main screening method during the past two years, since this has a lesser risk of exposure to COVID than a colonoscopy. And my other question would be, based on the data you presented, it looks like the PGH has a better successful transition into a new normal as far as performing colonoscopies are concerned as compared to NKTI. Is being done differently at PGH as compared to an NKTI? What are your thoughts, Dr. DeLuzong? All right. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Ruiz, for a, a very good question. So for the first question regarding um, FIT as the lead uh, diagnostic tool during the pandemic, I actually agree with you because um, people are obviously afraid to go into the hospitals do their colonoscopies because of the fear of getting COVID. And FIT is actually cheaper and could be more cost effective than directly doing colonoscopy. But of course, um, it has its um, evidence with, as you've mentioned with Dr. Levin from uh, Kaiser Permanente, which he, he showed that they could do a lot of FIT and then they showed that it can help people during the pandemic. Unfortunately for us, um, fit is not mailed to our houses, so people still go to the laboratories. They still have to schedule for it and then submit it. So it, it still means they go to the laboratory. Um, but it's better than a prolonged exposure like colonoscopy. So again, I, I would agree with you with the fit. Um, with regards to PGH, um, having more uh, colonoscopies during the pandemic, I think it's because of what Professor Soliano has mentioned. Um, better follow-up, better documentation, better recording. That's what we did. So we actually um, documented the people who are positive for fit during the pandemic. And then we also recorded all the patients who have high-risk conditions for uh, colon cancer. And then we followed up because we have a very strong telemedicine uh, system. So we followed up all of these patients. Every time there was a drop in the search, we called them up. We did colonoscopies left and right. And then if there's a surge again, and then we stopped the, 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 the colonoscopy, then we actually did fit in just screening via telemedicine. So that's the secret. And it's not 
just um, the the follow up. It's also rapport with patients. So it's um, it's it's a success story that should be emulated with other hospitals. And with that question, thank you again, Dr. Luis. Uh, thank you, Dr. Delusum, for giving those uh, very good answers. Uh, I think we have to congratulate the Philippine General Hospital for doing that strategy. And maybe the other hospitals, as you said, should emulate uh, uh, this particular technique. And let me just share uh, this experience that Dr. Levin last year shared with us. Uh, Dr. Levin is the uh, head of the colon cancer screening at Kaiser Permanente. And he was our main speaker last year in our webinar. And we did discuss about the pandemic situation and they said they actually had a drop as far as their colon cancer screening in the first three months or four months of the pandemic. But what they were able to do is they were able to push on the fit. And the advantage of fit is because you're going to have a lot of patients on your backlog list, right, for colonoscopies and other screening tests. But the fit actually kind of prioritize and prognosticate which patients to be scoped first. So if the patient has a fit, uh, that is negative, so they don't really need the colonoscopy sooner as compared to a patient who has a positive fit. So in a way, it kind of helped uh, them prognosticate and prioritize which patients should have the procedures first. So may I ask maybe if Dr. Soliano and Dr. Cairo have something to add uh, to the question that we posed to Dr. Delusum, Dr. Professor Soliana, you want to add something? Yeah, I think I think the effectiveness of fit is really one. It should be real, it should be able to touch the patient. It's not what uh, the experience of everybody in the Philippines today that they need to go to the lab. Uh, I think the fit test really is designed for a home test kind of approach so that uh, it becomes very effective. Uh, the second, of course, is the cultural acceptability of the test. Uh, you know, some some nations, uh, they don't want to mess up with stool. Some cultures uh, want to go to the hospital rather than just uh, do their own uh, test that is kind of messy. So, uh, in fact, uh, that, was, that is my question to Dr. Cairo later on, and I, maybe now is the time to ask that. Uh, while we are piloting the fit test to be one of the strategies, which is the most cost effective of all the studies that we have done, in the world, in the West especially, um, maybe the cultural acceptability of the fit test in the Filipino um, psyche is also an important data that we need to, to do and determine so that uh, if we roll out the fit test as our strategy, for example, that 90% uh, of the populations like 50 or 45 and above will be able to accept that as a test uh, because that's going to be one of the major factors for the success of our screening program. Thank you, Dr. Soliano. Dr. Cairo, you have anything to add? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Soliano. Uh, siya po yung uh, professor namin nung nasa med school pa kami. And, and so, it's good to see you again, Doc. So, uh, mahalaga po talaga yung cultural acceptability. Uh, Kinukonsider po yan ng Department of Health sa, sa piloting ng uh, any program. Kasi ho, uh, mahalaga po na matanggap po nila, no? Uh, hindi pwedeng uh, ipipilit natin sa kanila o yung post natin, yung, yung test na to, uh, mahalagang ma-prime po sila, ma-prepare po sila dahil uh, ano bang kahalagahan itong uh, screening test na to, ano bang may dudulot nito sa kanila, yun po yung namin, uh, magkakanak po kami ng mga orientation, uh, lalo na po sa mga implementers and uh, paano po nila i-orient yung, mga, yung target population natin. Kaya po ang unang plano talaga namin is uh, yung uh, lectures and uh, lay for ay uh, ikakanak muna sa let's say, sa community or barangay and or even hospital na uh, makaka-attend ng uh, lectures or lay for uh, sila po yung uh, agad natin iko-convince na magpa-screening uh, po mag uh, colorectal cancer screening using fit kasi uh, since nandoon na po sila sa sa venue limbawa kung in-person po yung, yung uh, lecture or even virtual, papupunta po natin sila sa, sa site or sa hospital na ma-avail po yung fit. And uh, may good news po ako sa inyo, uh, na-consult na po namin yung ibang experts natin kasi pag uh, using fit, quantitative and automated, kailangan ng cut-off value. 
So, uh, may 25, may 50, and 100. So, kung uh, yung iba po 100, uh, tayo po sa, sa Pilipinas, sisimulan po natin sa 25. So, that malaman po natin na uh, kasi pag bata na po, bata nga ho, no? sa, sa mga nakikita namin pasyente, yung malapit sa amin for the free medicines, kanina lang may nakita ako, 28 years old, female, uh, breadwinner, so stage 4 na po siya. Uh, colorectal cancer po yun. So, yun, 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 ganun po, uh, dapat talaga uh, babaan po natin yung cut-off so that uh, uh, mala, ma, ma, ano natin, ma, ma, ma-screen natin po, lalo yung mga at risk. And uh, of course, kailangan po natin yung sinabi ni Dr. Soliano mag, mag-conduct ng study on the prevalence uh, and risk factors of colorectal cancer in the Philippines. Kasi wala nga tayong data. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you Dr. Cairo. Thank you to all the doctors. Uh, we move on to our next question and I will address this question first to Professor Soliano. Uh, I really love your lecture on whether 45 will be the new 50 in the Philippines. Uh, just to add this very interest, just to add to this very interesting discussion, I reviewed the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force report, and it states, and let me share it with you, uh, the task force concludes with high certainty that screening for colorectal cancer in adults aged 50 to 75 has substantial net benefit and is given a grade A recommendation. So 50 to 75 grade A recommendation. The task force also concludes with moderate, so it's not uh, substantial, moderate certainty that screening for colorectal cancer in adults aged 45 to 49 has moderate net benefit and is given a grade B recommendation. So the other thing we need to also you know, take into account is uh, the relevant information are the following, that uh, th those studies were actually done on statistical modeling analysis. And those analyses were based on American patients, their lifespan, healthcare system, and the capacity of the government. Also, genetics point to a higher cancer prevalence among Caucasians, African Americans, Amer and American Indians as compared to Asians. And a case in point is like for the Philippines, the age standardized rate for colon cancer in the Philippines is around 20 per 100,000. But in the US, it is actually between 35 to 40 per 100,000. So just looking at the values, we actually have half the ASR in the US. So I, I know after listening to your lecture, you really hit the nail on the head when you said, we do not have data, we do not have the funds, and we do not have the infrastructure in the Philippines to arbitrarily lower this. However, in order to do this, and I think we need to convene all the stakeholders in this endeavor. And I hope, I think uh, Dr. Cairo did mention that, you know, uh, they started talking to the experts, but I think in the long run, you need to speak to all the uh, stakeholders. And uh, we know that some of our colleagues had started changing their practice, you know, without really, uh, you have to analyze the data based on uh, the American guidelines. So for Dr. Saliano, knowing these challenges so well in the Philippines, as you pointed out in your lecture, how would you advise a patient who may have heard it from another doctor that he needs to be screened at the age of 45 instead of 50? What will you tell the patient, Dr. Soliano? So how will you approach this particular situation, Professor? Yeah, thank you very much, John. Very interesting scenario. <clears throat> I think uh, if you are going to look at the entire Philippines as a, as a group of people where this uh, screening program is going to be implemented, then all the data that you have said is really important. And I think Dr. Cairo is very aware that uh, we need data to base national policy um, because that will cost uh, money, that will cost personnel, and that will cost uh, a lot of time before we are able to demonstrate uh, the value of that. However, on an individual patient basis, uh, I think the, the approach to that is really, uh, if I see a patient like that, I'll prob I'll, I will recommend a risk assessment immediately for that particular patient. See whether 
he belongs to the average risk individual versus a high risk individual. And at the moment, because there's really lack of data on whether we can push a 45 year old start of a screening program, I'll probably speak to him about what we have done in the Asia Pacific region. And of course, in the Philippine scenario, where we base our recommendation uh, based on review of the data from, say, Singapore, where they have some data, and of course, uh, uh, China, for example, and, and of course, the other Asian nations. Uh, because uh, doing this uh, particular patient as a single patient uh, will not only uh, benefit his uh, life expectancy, but clearly his, uh, his psyche. Uh, in some patients who have so much anxiety about colorectal cancer, uh, the threshold can be lowered a little bit to that age group in case that he has some risk factors uh, that are identifiable to put him at a high risk for developing uh, colonic cancer. However, if the risks are not there, then I'll probably educate the patient and say, okay, look, uh, while you can afford it, while you are a little bit anxious about it, let me see whether my talk to you and my orientation to you about the uh, screening can help you ease away that anxiety and we can look at 50 years old and see over time when he follows up whether that can help him re-educate and reorient himself about screening. Uh, sometimes we stick to that kind of principle, but uh, in a few times we, of course, uh, accede to this uh, individual aspect of uh, easing anxiety on the patients. And in a few patients, we do accede to doing a colonoscopy at an earlier age. But I think risk assessment on a one on a case by case basis is a, a key factor in deciding whether we want to do colonoscopy at a younger age. Uh, thank you, Professor Soliano. I agree with you. Uh, guidelines are supposed to guide clinicians, right? Y uh, you have to individualize uh, based on the risk factors of the patient. So I actually like uh, and I agree with your answer. Uh, may I ask uh, Dr. DeLusong if you have any thoughts and then maybe Dr. Cairo on that situation if you, ha if you have a patient uh, who has heard, you know, the change of screening from another physician and how would you approach it differently or you would approach it the same way? Uh, let's start with uh, Dr. DeLusong. Um, thank you, Dr. Ruiz. Ruiz. Um, of course, I had a lot of patients talking about um, their relatives from the States telling them that, that they should need a colonoscopy because it's now 45. And I would like to echo again Professor Soliano's sentiments that it should be personalized, individualized. Um, you should talk to the patient, be honest about it, tell them the data, that we don't have data actually, <laughs> and then <laughs> tell, tell them uh, what are the risks, if they're at risk, if they're not at risk, and then it will help them decide. It's basically their decision and not us pushing them for something that they don't want after all the information is given to them. Um, if they are at risk, you give the percentages. If they're not at risk, you tell them if they don't do this compared to if they do it at 50 years old. But of course, there's also the aspect of uh, easing their anxieties as mentioned. So um, I'm actually uh, more prone to accede to um, requests like that because it, in my opinion, a men the mental health is very important. If you remove the anxiety by telling the patient that you don't have colon cancer based on your colonoscopy, it might improve their well-being. So that's my that's my uh, opinion about it. Thank you, Dr. Luz. Uh, thank you, Dr. Luz. I agree that, you know, the mental psyche is a very important factor in dealing with our anxious patients. How about Dr. Cairo, since you're, you know, you're at the center of the Department of Health, coming up with a cancer screening program. And I understand you know, there has been some discussion uh, with certain sectors of society. Will you guys be changing your guidelines soon? I know uh, currently you're, you know, you're planning on uh, the age screening age of 50 after, you know, I'm sh I am think before this discussion, uh, we haven't really analyzed on the data as far as, you know, American guidelines. What are your thoughts now as far as, uh, you know, hearing uh, the the evidence uh, based on the the reason why uh, in America the screening age was lower from 50 to 45, and hearing Dr. Soliano that you know in the Philippines there are actually no data, Dr. Cairo. Yes, uh, uh, since uh, we are promoting uh, mass screening, 
Um, and the uh, so initial uh, consultation namin sa experts, uh, okay, 50 years old for those asymptomatic. But for, yun nga, may mga high risk, may family history, and then, uh, iba, may, may ilang ano, pasyente talaga na, iba nga, 30s pa lang, nakakaroon ng colorectal cancer. So, uh, uh, hindi natin sila uh, discourage na mag-avail ng uh, mass uh, screening test using FIT. Kasi uh, yun nga yung purpose ng FIT na automated and quantitative. Uh, dapat madami silang magpapatest. Unlike yung ibang uh, test na manual and qualitative, pa isa-isa. So that's applicable sa hospital na hindi po uh, uh, sakop ng ating mass screening test. But kung sakop po ng mass screening test, kahit below 50, 40s, 30s, basta kung may maja-justify kung bakit siya magpapatest, uh, wini-welcome po natin. Yun po yung sa, sa standpoint po ng Department of Health. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cairo. Just uh, for the information of everyone, uh, average risks are considered patients who don't have any risk factors other than age, which is 50. So if you have a family history of colon cancer, you actually should not be start screening at 50. You actually need to start screening at 40 or 10 years earlier before the index case. So the FIT, uh, at least you know, in America and the other countries, it's really used for more for average risk. So if you have a family history of uh, colon cancer, you know, your father had uh, colon cancer at the age of 55, uh, you don't have to go through FIT. You need a colonoscopy because you are high, a higher risk uh, than an average person without any family history. So this is just for the information of our viewers. So for the next question, moving on, uh, this is a question primarily for Dr. Cairo. Can you give us additional details on this plan? pilot project of the National Colon Cancer Screening Program that will be done in selected Philippine hospitals. When can we see this happening? And what is the healthcare era? How much will it cost the government? And if successful, what are our midterm plans? Dr. Kara, I know there's a lot of questions there because we are very excited to hear hmm. about the planned National Cancer Screening Program, and I hope uh, you could give us the details for those queries, Dr. Cairo. Yes, um, at this time, uh, nothing is final. Although, uh, nag, uh, nag develop no kami ng guidelines, so uh, may lumalabas nga hong uh, access sites for uh, the piloting of the National Colorectal Cancer Screening Program. Uh, ito po yung mga sumusunod ng hospital. Uh, number one, Mariano Marcos Memorial Hospital and Medical Center sa, sa Norte, uh, followed by uh, East Avenue Medical Center and San Lazaro Hospital dito po sa Metro Manila, and then uh, Vicente Soto uh, Memorial uh, Vicente Soto Memorial Medical Center sa Cebu, and then Zamboanga City Medical Center sa, sa Mindanao. And may dalawa po tayong... Uh, nakikita ng private hospital na willing makipag-forge ng memorandum of agreement with the DOH. Uh, ito po yung uh, St. Lord's Hospital dito sa Metro Manila and yung uh, Dagupan uh, Doctors Villa Flow or uh, Memorial Hospital sa Pangasinan. So, uh, magmumawa po uh, kasi yun po yung uh, protocol pag uh, private hospital uh, dapat may mo with the DOH and doon po sa Pangasinan, uh, itataya po po yung local government unit. So, pwedeng yung governor or yung mayor uh, kasama po sa MOA, sa so tripartite. Kasi nga ho, mayor sila, di ba? Yung national tax allotment na tinatawag, additional funding po yun. Kung medyo kumapos ang budget ng national, pwede pong saluhin ng local government fund. Kaya magandang, uh, maging, magandang model po yun. Uh, we encourage yung iba pang uh, LGUs na makipag uh, MOA sa, sa DOH and sa hospital na kung saan na uh, yun po yung magiging referral center for our cancer patients. And uh, yung guidelines, pinafinalize pa ho, at least yung cut of value na nalaman na po natin na 25. And uh, initially, ang magiging uh, test kits ay konti lang muna kasi uh, alam mo muna natin yung mga challenges sa uh, sa implementation and then taon-taon uh, po asahan nyo magpo-procure ang Department of Health ng uh, test kits 
na ibibigay po natin sa mga pasyente ng libre at uh, yung colonoscopy, uh, yun na po yung hospital, sasalin po nila through PhilHealth or even Malasakit Center. Yeah. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cairo. Any comments or feedback uh, from our two panelists? Maybe I'll start with Professor Soliano. Well, I'd like to thank the, the, the Department of Health for really uh, getting all the initial steps uh, already prepared and actually hitting the ground running. Uh, I remember that in the Philippine Consensus for Colorectal Cancer, we basically stated in one of the recommendations that the Philippines should have a national uh, screening program for colorectal cancer, and uh, we're very glad that we are now seeing the, the fruits of those uh, uh, push uh, years ago. So I, I wish you luck, and uh, my, my only request is that I think we need to uh, gather the data as much as we can and as early as we can and do some interim analysis on all the, all the implementing issues that you might be able to identify so that we can improve on that and maybe also as I said, the cultural acceptability of the IFOBD, uh, including, of course, uh, later on the uh, colonoscopies and the all other the confirmatory examinations that might be performed on how efficient we can do that. And as I said in the beginning, the recall system, uh, Clark, uh, I think the recall system should be very, very important because we can have positive IFOBD tests done in Caloocan or, say, in, uh, in uh, Pagadian. And then they don't come to the center for the confirmatory examination. So, So I think those are really the links and the algorithm that we need to follow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor thank you, Soliano. Uh, Dr. Delusong, do you have any advice for Dr. Cairo on this uh, uh, project? <laughs> Just a short comment. So, thank you very much and congratulations. Dr. Cairo for all the programs to help us with the Um, Quick question lang po. So, uh, would you be following uh, the U.S.'s footsteps in eventually doing fit for every household in the Philippines? Because I think, um, di ba, mask na ang kailangan natin eh. If you start with a few hospitals, um, you can't just stop there and add a, a more a more hospitals. You have to go to the households themselves because you know problem that you have to go to the hospital have the fit done and you have seen the success of the u.s nga in decreasing the the mortalities of colon cancer just by using that fit sending them to the houses and then they bring it back by a meal so would you be considering that strategy as well Dr. Cairo, uh, ultimately Yes, uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, ayun po yung ating gagawin na uh, eventually. Pag medyo in place na yung ating mass colorectal cancer screening, we will include that yung uh, sa household. Papadala po yung test kit. And then kasi self-collection uh, naman po yung uh, fit. And then, uh, yun, pwede po natin gawin yan. Uh, pwede po tayong mag-allocate ng budget for that. Sa tulong din po ng ating uh, local government. Kasi sabi nga natin, kung may uh, ordinance, Pwede pong uh, sila mismo ang mag-initiate ng uh, yung sa household uh, level ay uh, ipapadali mga test kit so that hindi na sila kailangan pang pumunta sa ospital. Yan. Maganda po yung uh, uh, method po na yan. Okay, thank you Dr. Cairo. Actually, this was a very lively discussion. And uh, actually, I really want to bring this up. And since last year, we, are, we have our webinar and we actually discussed the best practices from Kaiser Permanente, which uh, probably has the best cancer screening, not just colon cancer screening in America and probably in the world. So I want to share this. Uh, there's a slide that will be flashed and I will ask you what your thoughts are because these are kind of really the best practices and the fact that, you know, Dr. Delusong actually mentioned, are you gonna do mail-in? Are you gonna go house to house? And I think that brings a good point because if you, have a, if you want to have a successful program, you cannot just you know, send out fit and then no one's gonna follow up on the, the positive fit. There has to be some form of system to follow up. So uh, let me just kind of describe it a little bit. It's flash on the screen. So this is the overview of the Kaiser Permanente Northern California Cancer Screening Program. I actually work with Kaiser, so I'm very familiar and actually I was part of this uh, screening program. 
So they have a, uh, what they did was they, uh, they had this program, all members between 50 to 75, because at that time, I think they started around 2006. So it's been more than 15 years and they've been doing this really well. And they actually have an 80% compliance among their patients. And that's the highest in the US because their average is only 65%. And uh, they have approximately 1 million eligible members and around 900,000 of the 1 million are getting these annual fit cards. So what they do is uh, before they mail the fit card, they actually send a letter stating, we are mailing your fit card and please expect your fit card in a couple of weeks. And then after that, the fit kit is mailed and received. And if the fit kit is not returned, okay, they get a robocall reminder, like this is Dr. Cairo calling, uh, you have not uh, submitted yet your fit card, okay? And then if there's still no response after two weeks, so it's actually a month after the fit kit was mailed, they send a reminder postcard. And then, uh, then this is actually coming from one center. And then after that, they actually uh, send the patients to the individual centers. And then that individual, which could be via email or text, stating that you, know, you still have not submitted your fit card. And then after two weeks, if uh, there's still no response, a medical assistant, so a person actually calls them on the phone. So you could imagine you know, the intricate uh, uh, steps of how they were able to have this program you know, successful, the best in America. So I thought you know, by sharing this, since you know, we had Dr. Levine last year too, uh, in which they shared their best practices. So maybe this would be helpful for the Department of Health. So uh, maybe I could ask any uh, maybe comments from Dr. DeLuzong, Professor Soliano, and Dr. Cairo. Uh, what your thoughts are uh, on the Kaiser model? I know it's not 100% applicable here since, you know, uh, they're a first world country and they've been doing this, you know, for so many years. But sometimes it doesn't hurt when, you know, we try to adapt. We try to get uh, some tips from a cancer screening program that have been successful all these 15 years. So, Professor Siliano, you want to make some comments? And then so, Dr. Uh, I, Dr. I, have, I, have two, yeah, I have two comments left. Uh, you know that I do a lot of clinical studies a uh, long time ago, and I'm very familiar with recalls and uh, my CRA like to really as the backbone of this, they call the, the patients for, for their clinic visits. So we, we need this. Uh, in the era of uh, quadrimedia, whatever you call it, we can do this by, uh, by email, by SMS, by Viber, by Facebook, and we can, we can therefore, uh, suggest to the DOS use the social media to do this as well and we can have uh, automatic robo calls or robo prompts in order to be able to uh, remind people and the last the, the second part of course my comment is that this is actually just the first part tune the recall system is the other part of the of the entire exercise that when a positive test comes back then you have to call patients and this is another tedious job mm -hmm. a lot of work to, to be able to bring people for a uh, confirmatory examination a lot of challenge, but I think we can do this. Uh, yes, Dr. Soliano. Uh, Kaiser has a very uh, effective uh, communication and data system. So if the patient is actually fit positive, they get scheduled for a colonoscopy within four weeks. So the center where the patient is registered, they actually would call the patient to have the patient scheduled for a colonoscopy in four weeks. Uh, Dr. Kitts, uh, what are your uh, comments? Actually, that's that's um, that's where the problem is. I'm I'm thinking because if this rolls out and then you pass all the fit tests and then there's a lot of positive patients mm -hmm. now. Remember, we only have 451, 61 endoscopists. <laughs> <laughs> we will be overwhelmed. So we will need to be very careful about this and prepare for it. So that's why I I think Dr. Cairo is very smart in doing small batches first. And then we'll see. Improve on it. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Delusong. Uh, Dr. Cairo, any thoughts? Well, uh, under the cancer law, we have the cancer control policy in the workplace. Uh, it's still a work in progress, uh, care of uh, the Civil Service Commission for the government employees and uh, 
Department of Labor and Employment for the private sector. So, pwede pong isama yan na for the employees aged 50 and above uh, during their birthdays, pwede pong uh, nga, uh, gagawin yung fit and then uh, pwede pong i-shoulder ng kanilang HMO, Health Maintenance Organization, kasi it's also in the law ng ating insurance commission. Dapat uh, isama po yung mga screening test sa kanilang uh, services. Kasi di ba, madalas pag screening, hindi po kinocover. But under the cancer law, kailangan po i-cover yan ng HMO. So, I think pwede pong gawin yan na, uh, let's say, workplace-based muna, and then eventually pwedeng community-based. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cairo. Uh, that was actually the problem as a uh, practicing gastroenterologist. When I have patients who need to be screened uh, anoscopy, so they need to have symptoms, you know, they need to have constipation, they need to have rectal bleeding mm. in order for the colonoscopy to be actually covered by PhilHealth. So I think, you know, as an advocate, when I, uh, when I heard that the NICA was an approved uh, by Congress and then by, by, by the president, I even attended uh, the public forums on, uh, on the NICA, I was so happy when uh, President Duterte signed uh, this uh, few years back and we were happy to have uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Eric Tayag actually talk to one of our uh, colon cancer awareness advocacy on uh, the Universal Healthcare Act. So I think we do have time to entertain a few questions from our audience. Uh, this first question, I would probably give it to maybe uh, Dr. DeLusong. It's a GI question from uh, Mrs. Nene Hereza. I am 80 years old and I have not undergone any of those tests. Would you advise me to still undergo this test? How do I, how do I avail of those tests? Thank you, Paul. Okay, um, uh, Mrs. Hereza, that's a very good question that has been uh, a subject of debate among us, in gastro, uh, among gastroenterologists. It's because of the, the natural history of colon cancer that from polyp, na magiging cancer po yan, medyo matagal. So since you're already 80 years old, some would say na huwag na lang, sayang ang pera, kasi kahit umabot po kayo ng 100, magka-colon cancer man kayo, eh medyo delikado na magpa-opera or mag-treat. The other end of the spectrum naman, yung mga ibang doktor naman po, is as long as malakas po kayo, kaya nyo, magpa-colonoscopy na rin po kayo, kasi hindi lang ang benefit niyan is because na you will find out na wala kayong colon cancer. It's more of the, again, peace of mind and psychological benefit. Of it. Um, in my opinion, as I think Professor Surian would, would agree, is that it's personalized again. So we will talk to you in detail, in depth, telling you all the information about it, the risks and the benefits, etc., etc. And then we will discuss with you what's the benefit of colonoscopy versus not having colonoscopy even the financial aspects of it. And then after receiving all of the information, then you decide. We only suggest. So sometimes it depends on the doctor. Some would suggest you proceed with the colonoscopy. Some would suggest um, wag na. But again, it all boils down to you because you will sign the consent. So you have to get all the information. Uh, thank you, Dr. DeLusung. I would also answer it the same way as you did. Our next question is from Rian Texan. Good morning. A colon as big as P1, I'm not sure what uh, she meant by P1, one was peso. removed. Ah, uh, one peso was removed from my son's colon through a colonoscopy when he was four years old. He's now 24. I'd like to know what precautions he needs to take to avoid. I remember him being told that he should have an annual colonoscopy by the time he turns 30. Uh, by the way, the patient has no colorectal cancer history in the family. Thank you. Maybe we'll ask Dr. Professor Soliana to answer this question. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you, Bo, uh, Mrs. Texon or Ms. Texon. Um, I think uh, this polyp, if this was like four years old, this would be a juvenile polyp. And uh, we want to verify on that kind of biopsy. Uh, because if this is just a juvenile, a juvenile polyp, these are really benign polyps at four years old. So the removal of that particular polyp is basically curative uh, and uh, he belongs to an average risk individual as he grows old. I don't really understand why he needs to have a colonoscopy every year 
until 30 because uh, those juvenile polyps tend not to come back. Uh, and therefore, uh, his uh, recommendation will be really, after that particular colonoscopy, I might like to repeat one more colonoscopy after the removal of that polyp at five years old and then stop there and then uh, screen him again at 45 if he is very anxious and maybe screen him again at 50 if he's not very anxious about the colon cancer. At the moment, in 2022, that will be my answer. Yeah, no, I agree. Though Those are probably ju juvenile polyps. So our next question is from our friend, Gail Hippolyte Sarion. Hi, Doc. Uh, does it follow that you develop a polyp and once removed, it's possible that you are highly susceptible to have colon cancer uh, as compared to those who never develop a polyp at all? Maybe we'll ask Dr. Delusum to answer this question. So uh, again, thank you, um, Mrs. Sarion, for that nice question. Because if we remove a polyp, um, we have to have the histopathology report of that polyp. And that will uh, ans uh, make me answer your question. Because if the polyp is just a inflammatory polyp, it's just hyperplastic, then it means it's not a precancerous lesion. Then it means that your risk is the same as any other person uh, who has no cancer. If the polyp now has some semblance of precancer or even cancer, then your risk is higher than the uh, regular population. So you need to have um, closer follow-ups. Uh, that is why we repeat endoscopies earlier for people who have adenomas compared to people who don't have adenomas, which we say na 10 years na po tayo magkita kasi nga wala akong nakita. Um, kahit may polyp po nakita, if the polyp is inflammatory, as I've mentioned, it's, it's not cancerous or precancerous, then your risk is the same as an average person. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question is from Luisa Bonkatz. Good morning, doctors. I am turning 42 this year. Can I have an early screen test? Uh, since my father died uh, year 2019 at the age of 75, and I do have family history. Professor Soliano, I'm sure you could definitely answer this in, uh, with your eyes closed. <laughs> Go ahead and have a test that will save your uh, mental wellness, that will save your, that will extend your life expectancy. And uh, as long as you don't have any other contraindication, I think you need an early test, yes. And I think he did, uh, she did mention that she does have family history. So, you yeah. know, if you're, you actually should start screening at the age of 40, not 50. You don't have to wait for 50. Uh, I think a last question that we could probably entertain is from Aryan Soto. I'm 24 po, advisable po ba magpa-test for colorectal cancer? If yes po, ano pong signs and symptoms na need magpa-test? Maybe Dr. Klar, you want to get a crack on this enough? Since we've been talking about, you know, <laughs> cancer screening, there's, there's this 24-year-old asking magpa-test siya ng colorectal cancer. Anong advice natin, Dr. Anong advice ng DOH to Ms. Aryan? <laughs> Bata pa, 24. Madalas, di ba, wala namang sintomas. Pero kung may sintomas na siya at that time, talagang kailangan niya magpa-test. Yung sinabi nga na ating mga experts kanina na yung may blood in the stool, kasi nga kanina yung patient ko, 28 lang stage 4 na, di ba? Pero siya 24, baka naman wala nung family history. Hindi uh, naman kailangan magpanic. Pero sabi nga ni Dr. Soliano, mental wellness, uh, pwede naman magpa-fit. And then pag negative, uh, no further workups. I mean, hindi na kailangan magpa-colonoscopy. So, yun lang naman. Uh, observe lang for the signs, di ba, na pwedeng uh, sa colon cancer, like yun nga, yung blood in the stool, uh, yung... Uh, pag-change ng bowel habit, no? Biglang nagtatay, bati naman, regular, yung mga ganun, at wala namang infectious disease. Ilang kalamang ko, <laughs> sa mga gastroenterologist ang ating uh, kukonsultahin dyan. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Clark. So what I actually learned, uh, you know, recently with this incidence of, uh, you know, colon cancer occurring in patients really young, like, you know, less than 45 years old, especially a couple of years ago when, you know, our one of our Avengers stars, uh, Chadwick Boseman, was that... 
he was he died at the age of 43 but he was already 38 when he was first diagnosed so he was stage 3 and he has been receiving chemo but obviously it was his personal life and his health life is not actually you know open to public so uh, he had colon cancer for five years uh, but he got his cancer diagnosed at the age of 38 and the other fact the other fact is he's african-american and that's the reason that's one of his risk factors to of having uh, colon cancer at an earlier age so i think uh, at this point i would ask uh, all of our panelists to give you know uh, a message or your parting words to our audience uh, maybe we'll start with uh, dr de Luzong. all right i'll make it short and sweet uh, in mm -hmm. this uh, march colorectal cancer awareness month Please get tested, especially if you uh, listen to our lectures and you know you're at risk or you're about 45 or even 50 years old, get tested so we can get uh, the polyp at least and so we can prevent it and then we can beat colorectal cancer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Solian. Yeah, I think there's a lot of th uh, things to be hopeful. Uh, the DOS reported no deaths the other day from COVID. So we are rolling out a colorectal cancer screening program soon, already now. So uh, I think there's a lot of things to look forward to in the next uh, five, ten years. So uh, I think we have a lot of things that we can achieve with colorectal cancer. Okay. And uh, from the DOH, Dr. Cairo. Yes. Ngayong um, nasa alert level 1 na tayo. So uh, almost back to normal. Uh, galing po natin, no, lang sa adult population, uh, magpa-annual physical exam po tayo, isama po natin yung uh, screening for uh, colorectal cancer. So pwede nga po yung fit, and then yung, uh, depende po sa risk factors, pwede yung ituloy sa colonoscopy. Uh, prevention is cheaper than cure. Yun po yung uh, gusto namin ipabot sa inyo. And uh, sabi nga, yung colorectal cancer is preventable, treatable, and uh, beatable. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you to all our speakers. I will again uh, emphasize that colon cancer is preventable, it is treatable, and beatable. Okay, so we will be awarding our certificates to all our uh, speakers and panelists. And can we have it flashed on the screen? So uh, we will be sending it to our speakers via email. And this is uh in order uh, for your valuable contributions to the webinar and really thank you for spending your time with us so our time has ended and i would like to thank uh dr de Luzong, professor suliano dr cairo for sharing your knowledge and precious time with us we certainly learn a lot from this distinguished gentleman uh, we would like to thank a number of people here, uh, our TMC leaders for supporting us, Dr. Eugene Ramos, Dr. Ruben Casala, Dr. Trixi Chanko, Dr. Carla Cibolo, our gastroenterologists, our surgeons, our oncologists, our hardworking marketing team of the medical city, especially Ms. Tere and Mr. Gab Del Mundo, our corp communication officer, Tricia Reyes, Sarian Films, uh, Direct Blake, Gail, and Ariane, the Department of Health, and Undersecretary Maria Rosario Vergeri. We thank every one of you, guests and patient partners who attended and spent the precious morning with us. Thank you also to Nagasi Philippines and Westmont. We hope to be broadcasting live next year from our Barcelona Auditorium in March. Again, this is Dr. June Ruiz signing off. Be safe, everyone. Bye. Bye.